Uh, well, good evening. I'm Charles Wolfe, and I'm a member of the faculty at uh, UCSB of the Film and Media Studies Department. Um, and through the good efforts of the directors and staff of the Carsey Wolfe Center, you've had a chance to see Meet John Doe, this 1941 film that was written by Robert Riskin and directed by Frank Capra and produced by, um, by both of them uh, as an independent venture. Um, and I'm so very glad that many of you have stayed for this conversation with our very special uh, guest. Um, Victoria Riskin is the author of Fay Ray and Robert Riskin, a Hollywood memoir, a dual biography of her fascinating parents, um, each in their own right leading lights in the Hollywood cinema of the 1930s and 40s. And the publication of Vicki's book earlier this year um, really inspired this event tonight. And we talked quite a bit about what we might want to do to um, capitalize on um, this moment and uh, came upon uh, Meet John Doe as the uh, prime topic of conversation. You can read about um, her own remarkable career, highlights of her own remarkable career in the program that you have. Um, but I'd like to briefly flag three aspects of those accomplishments as a kind of frame for our conversation um, this evening. First, her training and clinical practice for many years as a psychologist and as a therapist. Her career as an award-winning screenwriter, including her tenure as president of the Writers Guild of America West. And her long-standing humanitarian endeavors, including her service on the International Board of Human Rights Watch and many other activities at the local level. And I mention um, these interests and these talents because they uh, point to something that is fully evident in the book um, that we'll be talking about um, this evening, where she interweaves accounts of her parents' lives, uh, both apart and together with one another, with what I think of as a kind of psychologist curiosity <laughs> about human behavior and what makes people tick, um, with a writer's knack for graceful narration and an eye for the telling detail, um, and a willingness to view the intimate aspects of her parents' lives in relation to larger social events, including political events on a national or an international stage, to include such things as the Great Depression and World War II and, and the blacklist years in Hollywood. So with that in mind, um, what I'd like to do, um, Vicki, is just turn our attention first to the film everyone has just seen, um, and for which your father explicitly took up the topic of political demagoguery um, in ways that probably have some echoes with our present moment. Um, he noticed. <laughs> <laughs> but did so in a way that was seen through the lens of questions of identity and common purpose um, and obviously issues related, related to media. So I wondered if you would begin by just describing your own relationship to the film, maybe when you first saw it um, and what it meant to you then and how the work on this book project might have changed your thinking mm. about it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here with me tonight. And uh, hello to everyone out there. It's just marvelous to be in a room with you. <laughs> um, and particularly to be with you, because you and I served on a committee uh, judging social justice documentaries for the uh, Santa Barbara International Film uh, Festival. And that was a great experience. And you were wonderful to work with. And I love Santa Barbara and the Pollock Theater and the Pollock family. So uh, begin with that. And I see that Janet Walker, who was also on the, the, the jury with us My for all those years. was fellow jury <laughs> member. Hi, Janet. This year as well. <laughs> so when I first, uh, in, in thinking of all the films that my father wrote, uh, it happened one night, Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, You Can't Take It With You, the film uh, Lady for a Day, American Madness. They all had uh, social commentary woven into them. But there was a lightness and a sweetness to those films. This film, um, I always thought of as having this kind of second part that was rather dark. And so I didn't really feel I understood it 
I remember my husband was going through some surgery and I was in the waiting room and it was on television. It was, I think, one of the few times I saw it is in a, a more recent years. Uh, he, my husband's fine, by the way. I know you're all <laughs> concerned. Um, and I found it very moving. And, um, but I think when I started to do the research for the book, and it parallels some things going on in the political landscape in the country, and the last times I've seen it over the last several months as I've been on tour, I found it profoundly moving. Mm -hmm. And I, I found um, this sense of how we are divided, uh, or how the political landscape has forced a divide among us. Um, the whole theme is you know, of the John Doe clubs is getting to know your neighbor, listening to them, finding out who they really are, and the way in which outside forces, political forces, attempt to manipulate and control a core and understandable sentiment people have about feeling lonely and isolated and wanting to communicate and wanting to be together, and then finding that's been hijacked uh, by, uh, by political machinery. And uh, one character that my father ever wrote who had no redeeming features was D.B. Norton. Hmm. At the time when they made the film, it was William Randolph Hearst, but today you could plug in Murdoch and mm -hmm. it, would, it would have the same resonance. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some speeches in the film that I find incredibly moving, the, certainly the one when he's giving the speech in the radio station. And I, my father had a tendency when he wrote, there, was, there were many little things that I recognized from one film to another. But a moment when the character just, it all, who he really is is revealed and what, he's, what his aspiration is. And, mm. and of course, it's interesting to me that Anne writes the speech for him because she's really writing the words of her father. And I'm writing the words of my father. And for the first time tonight watching it with mm. all of you, I began to see that parallel too, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so, so this film suddenly seemed even more meaningful maybe than all the others. And, uh, and it comes at a time, certainly in our history when we're struggling, but this was a time right before the lead up to the war, the mm -hmm. country was very divided. There were those who thought perhaps the communist philosophy was the solution to social troubles. There were those who were very anti-communist. There were those who thought Hitler was a bulwark against Russia. There were those who hated FDR, they, those who thought he was the savior of the country with the New Deal. Uh, and then there was what was going on in Europe at the time that they began working on the film. My father had gone, they'd formed a company, mm -hmm. Capra and Riskin had formed a company, my father went to Europe. The drumbeat of war was right there. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, Germany had in, invaded Russia, the part of Russia where my, my grandparents came from. And, and then by the, you know, so, so, so things were happening. Mm -hmm. um, and the fear of, of Hitler's rise and influence, even in this country. You know, there was the, the, the Nazi influence in the country. So, so a lot was woven into to this film, and it mm -hmm. shifted from being a romantic story to a, a story about the ills of the time. Yeah, the uh, I mean, I guess part of the the interest here is what the film would have meant for your father, and I know part of your research has been about the various ways in which there were echoes of Meet John Doe um, in some of his other writings. I'm wondering if you'd just talk about that a bit and describe You're thinking those. of uh, his writings in when he went to Europe or to... When, or he, when he was in London. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it so, had an afterlife, it seems, in his own he, way of he thinking. Was, he, was, he was living this story long after the film was over. Uh, and they had, uh, they had uh, screened it. And they were going to do a sequel, I think, Probably you know that. By yeah. the way, Chuck's one of the knows more about this film than I do because he did a wonderful <laughs> book about the film. <laughs> May I interview you? I think we should. 
so, um, but, but Americans were reluctant to get into the war, and my father, after, he decided not to make a sequel and to continue in his partnership with Capra. He volunteered with the Ministry of Information in England, and he went to England uh, to see what he could do to try to persuade the American public that we had to help the British and that the British were good people. Uh, and he admired Edward R. Murrow, who was broadcasting, for those of you who know your history, he was broadcasting mm. from London, these amazing radio broadcasts. So uh, my father went to, went to England and he um, um, signed up to, to, he signed up to help the Ministry of Information and he finally, uh, Edward R. Murrow's uh, CBS radio asked him to do a, a broadcast. And he's trying, he's been in England and he's trying to figure out uh, what's going on and he goes to Coventry. And I'll just read a little bit of this amazing, oh, can I, I have to tell one little story before I read this. I found this broadcast on a glass record because during the war they didn't have vinyl, they were using vinyl for other purposes, so this was on glass. And how was I gonna find out what was on there and what mm -hmm. he had said? It was in the bottom of a box of things that my mother had given me. So I'm calling all around the country trying to find someone who has the equipment to play the glass record and then digitize it so I could hear it. So I finally call the Museum of Modern Art in New York and they say, oh yes, we had the most amazing young man here who could do that kind of transfer uh, so you can hear the record. He sa they said, but he just, he just left. He went, to, <laughs> he went to California. I said, where in California? Do you have an address for him? And uh, she said, oh, he's at the University of California at Santa Barbara. <laughs> I called him and went down State Street to his house, <laughs> and he did the transfer of, of, this, of this speech that my father gave when uh, went on the CBS Edward R. Murrow show. And um, he's, uh, he, he uh, well, let me get to the right one, excuse me, it's over here, okay. so. Now he's, he's gone to Coventry, and he has seen the, uh, the ruins from the, from the bombing. And he, he says, it's difficult to believe that such devastation could be possible where human beings once lived. Each mass of debris represents a home of someone that someone has dreamed about and planned, worked and saved for, where children were born and old people died, where family bonds were cemented, where they shared their successes and failures and their joys and their sorrows. And now a pile of mortar and brick is all that is left of those dreams. Where, while I stood there, a child appeared. It was a tow-headed youngster of about five years old. He came from around the corner, walked to the middle of the street, sat down and began to play, all by himself. It was a weird picture in the midst of all the emptiness and destruction. I had a feeling that civilization had been wiped out, and here started the beginning of a new life, of a new world. I spoke to the child and asked where his playmates were. They all moved away, he said, and then his little face brightened. But mom said they're coming back after the war. Under the constant threat of decimation, you never crush the spirit that inspired Joe London, the average man during the worst days, through a display of courage that captured the admiration of the entire world. What Joe London did here should be a warning to Hitler that he, he is confronted by a force that is more powerful than all his cannons and all his military victories, a force that will inevitably be responsible for his undoing. And it is particularly significant and wonderful that Joe London is nobody special, no miracle man, no phenomenon. He's just an average guy, the sort you're likely to meet anywhere. 
Joe London is Joe Bridgeport with a Cockney accent, or Joe Chicago with a Yorkshire accent, or Joe Seattle with a Scotch accent. He's just folks. He's you and me, or the fella down the street, or Uncle Harry who works at the post office, who keeps getting in trouble with women. <laughs> He's the soft-spoken minister at that church down Main Street, or Mrs. Murphy who runs the boarding house, or that riveter in the ironworks whose wife can't keep him away from Kelly's pool hall. He works in Macy's basement, a bank in Kansas City, and on the docks of San Diego. No, sir, John, Joe London is nothing special, but the average guy is never sp special. Where he, he's a surprise, it's only to those who underestimate his strength, who never gave him credit for having what it takes of course, Joe London can take it. So can Joe Bridgeport. So can you. So can anybody when the things he believes in are being threatened. And that's the impulse behind Joe London. He's going on taking it, and he might even wake up and start getting it, some of it out. But there's one thing you can be sure about. You never quit until the job's done, until the force that seeks to throttle this freedom are rubbed out of existence. That was for Edward R. Murrow on CBS. That was a piece of the what I found on the glass mm -hmm. recording. So he's saying to America, you and the Brits and you, the average Brit and you are the same, and we're all in this together. And we have to recognize our strength because it's really the average guys that have the strength in the end of the day and are basically good and make a difference. And that's really the sort of that radio broadcast, too, in the film, don't you think? Yeah, no, listening to that, I'm reminded of the degree to which the films themselves, but particularly this one um, uh, that he wrote, are filled with a lot of tales about minor characters, how mm -hmm. he quickly and deftly gives a personality to even yeah. the smallest characters, so that um, even as he's building this broader picture of a community, you see specificity. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I really love the Colonel, uh, Walter mm -hmm. Brennan, in this film, because mm -hmm. just when you think the film's going to get a little sappy, this guy in the corner saying, rolling his eyes, mm -hmm. you know, and um, it's sort of, he, he's the echo back. He, he's the reminder uh, that. Uh, there's another way of looking at this, and he can talk about the helots. I think my dad made that word up. Do you mm -hmm. think so? I think so. I, yeah. 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 I've looked it up. It's, uh, he made yeah. it up. Yeah. But this idea that pretty soon, if you're not careful, you'll get sucked, sucked into this world where you're going to have to have more and more and more and more, and pretty soon you don't have a life. You can't go fishing. You can't just be a free spirit, you know. And this again, this is the p era of the depression. The people unemployed still, despite the New Deal. People really struggling in the country. And you know, folks, as some of the folks, I hate that. Anyway, that's what's going on now for us, right? I mean, there are people really struggling, doing two or three jobs, and being kind of noble about it, but but sometimes getting pretty mad uh, mm -hmm. about their situation and not thinking the future is going to be better for them or for their kids. But we can, we can change that. <laughs> um, since we don't have a lot of time here, I must at least ask you about the ending uh, to this film, which was so, such a struggle for your father and for Frank Capra. They went through so many different versions of it, and yeah. that's complicated history. And, they spent six months writing the original script and then uh, shot that script and then decided that it wasn't right and they went back. I mean, it's because they were independent that they were able to do this, um, but it didn't solve the problem of how they were going to end this particular story, yeah. given the forces that had been put into motion right. by, the, by, by the plot itself. So I'm just curious whether you have any strong feelings about the ending in its current form, or as a screenwriter yourself, <laughs> who's had to solve problems with endings, right. you would have imagined something different. It's a difficult film to end, isn't it? Because in one way, you think, 
uh, he is now wants to prove that he's legitimate. And so the only way to do that is to commit suicide. And I know, and we talked earlier about how there were n news stories that said that he was, they were gonna end the film with Gary Cooper dying. Uh, you know, that's, you invest a lot of money in an actor and then you kill him at the end. I don't know, it's not such a good idea. <laughs> But that would never have been acceptable to an audience, you know. And then there was a ver version, we talked about this too, because Chuck's done a lot of research and wrote a wonderful book about the, about the film, where D.B. Norton suddenly turns and... Becomes he, converted. He becomes converted. He realizes that this uh, John Doe is re really a good man and, and he sort of is apologetic or whatever. And they screened that for audiences, and the audiences did not like that. Right. They certainly want Barbara Stanwyck and Gary Cooper to get together, right? So in the end, they went back and shot, Frank, Frank Capper shot it again, and this time you have the uh, John Doe Club people say, you know, we, don't give up. Uh, we, we are there for you, and let's, let's keep on, keeping on, have faith, and... Um, I think that's about as best you can do to get off the stage with this story that they've, <laughs> that they've built up. <laughs> well, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting in part, too, because um, the way the sequence here was that they had um, decided to go back to the City Hall roof set and shoot the ending where Norton now says in the spirit of Christmas um, that he's been converted in some way. And they did that. They shot that on January third, right after Christmas, as if they were themselves, or by this point, your dad was in New York mm -hmm. uh, working on, on the promotion for the, for the film. But the, uh, my thought is that perhaps in the spirit of the holidays, they were uh, moved to think that that might be a way out of the storyline. But they then screened it for, in three cities on March 12th, and that's when there was this reaction. This is, mm -hmm. no, we, we will not accept the conversion of D.B. Norton here at the end. And, <laughs> they, and, they weren't going to like him, and then they were going to change their feelings about him. Well, and here's the interesting part. Yeah. They immediately notify the theaters to, to cut that sequence out of the film, yeah. uh, to stop it. And then Capra goes back to the roof one more time, two weeks later, um, and shoots the John Doe Club arriving. And if you go through the letters and correspondence that um, Capra received, uh, uh, in response to the film, um, there was many suggestions about how they could come up, come up with a better ending <laughs> for it. People were expressed being moved by the story, yeah. but that the ending had let them down in some way. And Capra in his autobiography says that there was somebody who signed his name John Doe who suggested this ending. That's not quite right. That's a right. little bit of a fabrication, but you do see that suggestion in those letters from hmm. some of the people. So, so the notion were, that the audience, in fact, is yeah, writing themselves back into the film in some way. They were invested in the story and they mm -hmm. wanted it to come out right. Well, that's pretty terrific, actually, yeah. <laughs> that uh, they were part of that process. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, as I screened it around the country, it's this on my book tour, it's evoked a lot of great conversation. And um, I was just in, uh, so when you're on book tour, sometimes you go to places you think, oh, I, I can't even believe I would ever be in Mars, Pennsylvania, but there I was. And I was being hosted by, uh, at a convention. Um, and I just felt like I was talking to the people in the John Doe clubs, you know, mm -hmm. there, because my the person ushering me around was uh, a retired postman, and his wife was a, um, a bookkeeper, and she had retired. And I said gingerly, "What do you think of everything going on in the country, and you know, sort of the political landscape? I don't even think I use the word political, but the landscape mm -hmm. of what's going on." And she just looked at me and she said, "I hate all the fighting." I just pe wish people would get along. Now that sounds really simplistic, but I sort of feel that way too. And um, uh, you know, it's the church that's holding them together. It's mm. not the outside forces. That's too overwhelming, confusing, and who's telling the truth? It, the other thing is the manipulation of you know the fake news theme mm. that yeah. is in this film echoed for me too. Um, and that's kind of then people lose faith in each other. 
you know, they start to feel what's true, what's, what's right. They mm -hmm. don't know anymore. Right. And we all want to get back to that, I think, right? Right. When you were um, uh, 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 president of the, of the Writers Guild, I know you were outspoken on the issue of media consolidation mm -hmm. when you were working with the, with the Guild. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are about that as it's evolved over the past decade and, and what, what's at stake at that? I mean, this is obviously a film that raises the question from the perspective of the 30s about radio and, right. uh, and uh, film um, and Time magazine and how these, this entire apparatus becomes complicit in the, in the fabrication. And, uh, yeah, how, I'm kind of a, a, I, I'm a believer in this idea of the marketplace of ideas, a robust marketplace. And when there are a few media companies who control the pipeline of information, um, it, it, it narrows opportunities. And uh, so it was a big fight. I was <laughs> with mm -hmm. the FCC. I didn't fight with them. I expressed my views strongly um, <laughs> about the importance of making media as open to as many different voices as possible. Now we have a whole different thing going on. I mm. can't quite absorb the magnitude of it with social media. Mm. And uh, I sort of wish we'd go back to consolidation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just kidding. But yeah. in a way, there's such a flood of sort of undigested, undigested thinking out there that is just reactive. And the one thing that's really important is that we do keep the journalism, the, fa the genuinely fair and objective journalism as much as possible, that we protect that. But there is now, there's Netflix and there's Amazon, you know, the old, the old companies mm -hmm. that were dinosaurs. They were crushing under their own weight. The studios are really just banks now for big mm -hmm. action movies. And there's a lot of wonderful creativity going on in television. It's just an amazing era. So, you know, maybe my fears were slightly uh, mis, mis, you know, I should have just known something new would happen. But I was one of those people who said with great confidence that reality TV would never survive. <laughs> so, you know, pretty much if I say something, just imagine the opposite to be true, ultimately. It was actually a wish on my part <laughs> that it would go away. Um, let's go back to your, to your father for a moment. I want to make sure we also follow up with the narrative of his engagement with um, alternatives to Hollywood filmmaking and his interest in other ways in which media could function and filmmaking could function particularly his work with the Office of War Information mm -hmm. uh, during the war. And then even after, he was kind of a, became a proponent of nonprofit filmmaking. That's right. He had this yeah. crazy idea. Um, yeah. Well, it, during World War II, he, he, was, uh, got, he was desperate to do something for the war effort. Everyone, em you know, Hollywood emptied out. And he, he got a position heading up a division of the Office of War Information, which was part of the War Department, to make movies for consumption uniquely for the overseas market, for the people who'd been living under fascism. And his mandate was to figure out how to tell stories that would, uh, that would tell the story of what America was really like. And of course, the first impulse might have been for some to make very patriotic kind of aren't we great films. But he totally rejected that idea. There was another idea was to make films that would show people living under fascism how terrible Mussolini and Hitler were. That was Wild Bill Donovan's mm -hmm. concept mm -hmm. of overseas filmmaking. My father wanted to just tell stories of American ingenuity, of small towns, of the immigrant experience, of the idea of freedom. And he did 26 films in two and a half years. They were short films, and, but they, uh, they distributed them following, actually, Eisenhower's army of occupation. So they would occupy towns, say, in North Africa, in Sicily, and in Italy. And um, truckloads of films would follow, 
and they would open up theaters, turn the lights on again, get the projectors going, because his idea was if people would fall in love with America, if people saw movies, they would fall in love with America. Mm -hmm. He also um, took along with him about 50 Hollywood films that he carefully selected. Mm -hmm. He did not choose Meet John Doe. Mm -hmm. He didn't choose mm -hmm. Casablanca either. Mm -hmm. He wanted uh, films that would make people feel good about America. And um, it was an enormous, it was probably the largest and most impactful uh, filmmaking project during the war. Yeah. So he opened up 3,000 theaters, his team, and uh, they went all the way into Germany, following the, the, the troops into Germany. He was gone a great deal during that time. Uh, my mother was alone with my sister and a new baby in New York. Hmm. And um, he wrote amazing letters to my mother during that era. But, uh, and that was wonderful too for me to discover. So, uh, but the idea, and I think if you asked yourself, what would you, if you were telling audiences in other parts of the world what um, the best of America is like, how would you tell that story? And that was his charge. So he did one about the immigrants, the Swedish immigrants who came to the middle of the country and Ingrid Bergman was the narrator. Mm. Mm. He did one about Toscanini coming to America and showed him uh, conducting the NBC Orchestra and the Hymn of the Nations. It's a very moving piece of mm. filmmaking mm. because he plays all the national anthems of all of the uh, allied countries in the middle of this beautiful, um, uh, piece. Uh, he did one about a small town in America called the town Eric von Sternberg. Joseph von Sternberg. Joseph von Sternberg. Forgive me. Right. Joseph von Sternberg did right. that one. Um, he did one about immigrants, and they they don't say they're Jewish immigrants, but coming to a small town in uh, Co Covington in uh, coming Covington in Vermont and what it's like for a foreign family who doesn't speak English to come into a town and how people are suspicious of them and then yeah. finally they sort of learn enough English and they tell who they are and they make friends before they go back to their countries. He did one about the, the Empire State Building because they wanted to show what the big cities were like but instead of saying look at the great big cities in America the focus is the guy who washes the windows on the Empire State Building. And it's sort of this Buster Keaton character who climbs out the mm. window and straddles up and down and, you know, papers flow out, fly out the window and he's, but he loves his job. And in the background, you see the amazing skyline of New York. And little by little, as people saw these films in Europe, they began to like America. The one that was the most popular was called The Autobiography of a Jeep. Yeah. And he took all this footage of the Jeep coming off the assembly line and going into the, you know, ca working, carrying soldiers in the rough terrain. But it's narrated by the Jeep itself. And he says, you know, I, everybody thought I was ugly. No one thought I would succeed. Finally, I had to prove myself. I made a friend of the soldier. I made friends with dignitaries and generals. And finally, I'm a success. And <laughs> kids in France, when they saw this, started to leap up and cheer, you know, viva la Jeep, viva la Jeep. <laughs> so it was understanding that these simple things in life were what would, would appeal to European audiences instead of saying we're great and you we won and you lost you know mm -hmm. what good would that have done so you know up recently a woman a german woman made a documentary about this filmmaking project uh, and i asked her why would you make a film now about this filmmaking project my father did and she said well after 9 11 everybody felt so sympathetic towards america and then that sympathy faded. And I asked my grandparents how it was that they fell in love with America after the war and since German cities had been so badly bombed and they remembered these movies. And she said, so I wanted to know who made these films, who was the, who, who had spearheaded them, who was the creator behind them. Mm -hmm. 
So she did a film, a documentary about my dad. Yeah. It's Projections of America. Projections of America, and you can see it on Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> it's there, yeah. and it's, it's a lovely film. Yeah. And then, um, uh, and then you were born. <laughs> I was born. I was named after the victory of the war. Oh. <laughs> or Queen Victoria. I'm not quite sure <laughs> which. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, you lost your dad at a very early age. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm curious whether you were aware during those years, as as, as a young person, of the, the world of the movies that he was involved in, um, or projects mm -hmm. that he was working on? Was that part of your experience? Very much so. I mean, I, I think by the time I could understand the English language, <laughs> when I was three or four and went to school, the first thing anybody says to you in kindergarten, if you're in Los Angeles, is, are your parents in the business? <laughs> you know, you know you're part of a very special world. And indeed, we had a beautiful home, and there was lots of fun and parties and uh, fireworks at 4th of July like crazy and square dancing. And Hollywood and the orbit that my parents were in was very creative, very imaginative, uh, and glamorous, but not in an ostentatious way. They were very smart people who, who just were having a great time. Now, I know mm. there were difficulties, and people were having marital problems, but I didn't get any of that. I just mm. thought mm. we lived sort of in a magic kingdom. Mm -hmm. I really thought it was like a magic kingdom. Mm. You know, you have, a, you have people come to dinner like, Cary Grant, <laughs> uh, or, or Harpo Marx, or Rosalind Russell. And that was just, those were the people who came, you know, who came over for stuff, for parties. Although when Harpo Marx came, um, my mother said to me, sweetheart, this is that very funny man, because we had a copy in our house of uh, A Night at the Opera. And I loved Harpo Marx with his curly hair and his horn and his coat and he pulled things out of and the way he picked up his knee and handed it to somebody, you know, next to him. He was marvelous. He was just mm -hmm. a great comedian. She said, this is that funny man that you love so much, Harpo Marx. Well, this guy had no hair. He had a silk tie, a lovely suit. And I thought, this is the ter my mother is pulling a trick on me. This is terrible. And I said, how do you do? And I ran away because I so believed. <laughs> I didn't understand that this, they were acting. I just thought that was the world that I went into with them. And then, of course, my dad got had a stroke, and a lot of that glamorous life changed because our family then turned into a family caring for someone who was ill. Yeah. And my mother was quite heroic through all of that. Well, all the readers of your book are grateful for um, your ability to bring that all back to, to life again in, in the pages mm. of the book. Well, um, I think we're out of time, but thank you so much, Vicki, for um, this conversation. And thank for you for coming, everybody.